Right. Good evening. Welcome along to NUFC Matters Crime Podcast with me, Steve Wraith. And tonight's special guest is Paddy Maloney. How are you, Paddy? I'm fine, Steve. Thank you. Great stuff. Uh, got you on because you've got a really uh, interesting book, um, which you've just released through Warcry Press Publishing. Uh, the Ultra Boy. Um, I mean, look, it's it's a cracking it's a cracking book, cracking read, and I, I'm going to give the details in the in the link uh, at the bottom of the interview. I'm I'm going to ask you a few questions, um, you know, which you know I'm sure you'll be able to answer. And um, you know, we've got 40 minutes, so let's start off with Middlesbrough, the place that you were you were born. Um, was it a rough place to be brought up in, Paddy? Yeah, I think Middlesbrough has always been a rough place. It's in the northeast, and it's a working town, isn't it? Yeah. And it's always been a working town. The steelworks and such, the docks and things like that, yeah. Yeah, I mean, um, you know, what was it like growing up there? Did you have a happy childhood? Yeah, I did have a happy childhood, yeah. Yeah, because, I mean, we didn't have much. But I think everyone was in the same boat, you know. We all had the same, and, and yeah, I had an happy childhood. childhood. Uh, Eastern Street, uh, that's where I lived, in Groveville. Yeah. When I was about... 10, 12 year old. Yeah, it was, it was brilliant. I loved it. Yeah. And I mean, what was school like? Were you, were you a bit of a scholar at school, Paddy? No, I wasn't a scholar. <laughs> but I, I mean, I wasn't thick. I was very quiet at school. I was very quiet. Yeah. I had two older sisters who, followed, who I followed the school, see, so like, I was always like quite safe at school. Yeah. I mean, what was it, you know, what subjects were you into at school? Or were, you, were you into sport or were you into, you know, you know what, what, were you, what were your interests at school? You know, funny enough, I, was, I wasn't into football, so, and that's all of sport there was them days, really. So I wasn't into sport, no. But uh, just a normal class, you know, you're doing your English, your maths. I wasn't very good at maths. I was okay at English. Yeah. Uh, we had to do religion. We had to do that. Stuff like that. School was an happy time for me. Yeah, go to school. Was it a, was it strict in those days? But you know, were you? Yeah, yeah. I went to St Joseph's, and uh, it was run by nuns, so it was very strict. Yeah, but I mean, my sisters hated them, but I got on okay with them. Yeah, you know. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I mean, it's um, you know, it's one of those things. It's a working class area, Middlesbrough, isn't it? It's very much like where yeah, I'm yeah. In northeast Liverpool, Newcastle, yeah. of course, and you know the you know distinct places, distinct accents, and um, yeah. Well, you you know you either sink or swim in places like that. I mean, yeah. Again, there's not many opportunities either. You know, there is that north south divide, and with with the northeast, it, it you know it's it's not a, it's not particularly. You know, affluent area. It's not a rich area, and you, if you don't get the, the early opportunities in life, then you, you turn to crime. So, you know, when did you first start to get involved in crime, Paddy? Well, I've been about fifteen year old, and, and like like you say, it's it's uh, if you don't succeed at something, if you don't if you don't take your chances, like get yourself a good career behind you, which I've always said from day one. If you don't get a good good career behind you, you're going to fall away, and you're going to start trying to earn money for yourself, for your family, for your, you know, to live on. And I was about 15 years old when I first turned the crime. Yeah. What kind of crime would you into at that age? Uh, I'd sort of given up on school. We, we were like playing show and we were nicking off. And there was a, there was a crowd of us. Uh, and it was from a, from a part of the Middlesbrough called Over the Border, St. Elders. You'll, you'll have heard of Terry Dixon. Yes, yeah, yeah. yeah. Yeah, it was me, Teddy Dixon, John Graham, Jimmy Carey. We used to wear, I had an awesome cart, a 15 year old, and we'd go out the night before, pinch as much scrap as we could and hide it, then go and pick it up on the awesome cart. And that's what we'd done that for about, about 12, 14 months till we got caught. Yeah, and that was my first taste of uh, going to court. Yeah. Was it a good, was it a good earner that? I mean, obviously, you know, for, for somebody your age, were you, were you making a few quid? But well, you know, a 15 year old, I mean, I don't know where the money went. Yeah, we, we were, I was making more than my dad. My dad was a docker. He worked hard, he worked shift works. You know, he worked every hour that God sent. But yeah, we, we, I was earning more than my dad. Wow. But you just, I mean, when I say we're earning more than my dad, it would probably been about three, four, five, six, seven quid a week. Yeah. And in them days, it was a lot of money. I was 15, it's a long time ago. But we just wasted it on clothes, things like that, trying to sneak into pubs. 
you know, things like that. So obviously, yeah. obviously, you say you got caught. How did you get caught? Uh, we found this little estate in Middlesbrough. But it's near off the town centre called North Armsby. It's known in Middlesbrough as Doggy. And what they were doing there was, I mean, all the all of the area was it, the houses were empty. They were refurbing the houses. Yeah. And in the houses was cast iron baths and outside toilets with lead boxes. And all these houses were empty. No one living there. The windows were all out. We were taking the lead boxes and the cast iron baths. And somebody reported, obviously, seen, we've been there for about two weeks, don't we? Somebody reported us and we got arrested in the backyard with a cast iron bath and sledgehammer and bolt cutters and an awesome cart. And uh, we got arrested, got charged, we were going to crew for theft with an awesome cart. So embarrassing. Embarrassing, you say. Did you feel did you feel guilty? Were you were you concerned about what, what the reaction was going to be like at home? My mum always covered for us. My mum always covered as mum's do. So my dad didn't really know much about it until it was too late. Uh, when, when I went to court, I didn't feel embarrassed because I you know, I really didn't feel as though we were criminals at the time. You know, because the, the there were empty houses. We weren't breaking into people's houses or nothing like that. But obviously we were. I mean, they were going to be replaced somewhere else. I don't know what was going to happen with the cast iron baths and the red boxes. But we decided that we wanted them and we took them. But uh, I got parcel for that. My first time of court, I got parcel. My first taste of court, and I got sent to parcel. Yeah. Was that a surprise? Years. Was that a surprise to you? Were you expecting to just get a rap on the knuckles, a fine, or or something like? Yeah, that? Yeah, I was. Yeah, because there was four of us of court. And what had happened? The three lads from over the border would collect the awesome cart and they'd come and pick me up. And on the awesome cart, we had a big mat, some cushions, and under the mat was the sledgehammer and the ball cutters. So my solicitor was saying, When they picked you up, you were never seen them, so you didn't know they were there. So we pleaded not guilty. Mm -hmm. I pleaded not guilty. Mm -hmm. And the judge, for that reason, sent me to Borsal. The others got a slap on the wrist. Wow. Yeah. So tell us about tell us about going into Borstal, Paddy. What was it like? You know, were you it was, were you nervous? It was awesome, about? Mate. Yeah, yeah. When I got when I first got my Borstal, I mean, I went to Durham Jail, a fifteen year old, and like that was terrible. It was it was like I wasn't on my own. Don't get me wrong. There was there was a there was a lot of lads in there from the northeast waiting to go to Borstal, and it was an eye opener. You you were mixing with the cons, you were mixing with convicts, you know. It was and. That was, you know, that was an eye-opener. Yeah, it was terrible. I mean, 15-year-old, all we'd done was like, we'd scrub landings all day long and just try and, you know, mm. probably cry ourselves to sleep. Were you in a... Oh, in you, the prison, them days was bad. Were you in a dormitory then, Paddy? Were you, or were you in a no, cell? No, no, you're in a cell. You're in an old cell. In the cells in Durham, them days, you didn't have a toilet, you had a pot, or you had to do your, whatever you'd done in it. And, yep. a, and a bowl and a sink to get washed. You didn't get showers. You had to get, had to get a strip wash in your cell. Mm -hmm. You know, I was exercise a day. It was hard. It was hard. I was scared in there, yeah. yeah what what kind of mentality did you go in with? I mean, did you go in with a... Did you have a... Did you put a face on? Were you putting a brave face on? Were you... Because you hear... Not in Durham, I didn't. No. Not in Durham, no. No. You, you couldn't because you, was, you were all struck. There was, there was men in there, I mean... The likes of, I mean, Jamie Bowles in the boot on him, Paul Sykes, the likes of them remember in there when, when, when I went to Boston, yeah. a 15 year old. And like, you're in awe of them people. It wasn't just Paul Sykes, I can't remember the names, but you, people get pointed out here. And yeah, it was, you know, but that you think that's the worst, and then you go to Strange Ways, which is in Manchester. That, was a, that used to have an allocation centre in there for Boston's. But you did go on a, on a, on a wing then, like you were just, like, in, you're still in a cell, but you're on a wing. And uh, you got allocated from there to a Borstal because it's, it was probably about 40, 50 Borstals in Great Britain. Mm -hmm. And I got allocated to Weatherby. So I was in Durham about about five, six weeks. Then I went to Strange Ways. I was in there about 12 weeks. Now, all that doesn't count as Borstal. Your Borstal starts the day you arrive at your Borstal, which is six months to two year. And yet your average is like 10 months to 14 months. Mm -hmm. So, I mean, Strange Ways was terrifying. You had to march everywhere, jog everywhere. The screws were terrible. In Durham, the screws weren't that bad, but in strange ways, the screws used to eat you. They would eat you, yeah. I mean, it's yeah. frightening as well to be out of your out of your area. I know you're in. I know you're. You know, you're in a. You're actually in a jail, but to to not yeah. 
to not be close to home, so that makes yeah. it more difficult for visits and, and stuff like yeah. that. Yeah, because my family, most families didn't have cars them days, and my mum and my two sisters used to come and visit me. Yeah, they probably had to get two or three buses on a train. Yeah. But they did used to come, so it must have been really hard for them. But me being 15 didn't realise that, you know. What was, it, what was it like for you for the visits? I mean, is that, we hear a lot of people who've been inside, it, it, you know, sometimes visits, they prefer not to have them because it reminds you of home, and then when you go off a visit, you're, you're really upset, or was it... Was it something that you actually looked forward to when you, you gained a bit of strength from that because you knew you had the support from back home? I think when I was 15 year old, I, I, I needed the visits. I needed them, yeah. It, 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 uh, it's when you get older that you don't prepare your visits. But at 15 year old, yeah, I wanted to see my mum. I wanted to see my sisters. I didn't realise what I was putting them through yeah. to travel there though, you know what I mean? But yeah, I needed them visits, yeah. Were you much of a letter writer? I learned, you know, my writing wasn't very clever, but I mean, it, it's, it's, it's quite good now. I yeah. spent quite a, quite a while in jail, so it does improve, yeah. What was the, what was the worst thing that you saw in, in, in that time in jail, Paddy? As, as, a, t as a young man, as a 15 year old, uh, do, you know, do you know, you know, you just see what happens in them man's jails, you keep away from it, and yeah. you're locked up most of the time. It was when I left, when I left Strangers, I got allocated to Weatherby Borstal. And you know what it was like? It was like being sent to a private school. I mean, it was such like a, like, like a big weight off your shoulders. Because yeah. you got there, and it was, I think Weatherby must have been an old Air Force place. It was all dormitories. The prison officers was civilian clothes. And they, they, treated you like, they treated you quite well, actually. It was like, like, you had to do your school work, you had to go back to education. You had to do all that. So, and you're in a dormitory, then you got your own cell, your own room, it wasn't a cell, the door opened. It was, it was a massive relief from Durham and Strange Ways. So, there was, there was no fear. I mean, I was never bullied in there, never picked on. I'm not saying that it didn't happen, but I never came across it. Yeah. You know, but it was a relief to get to Barstow. It was a relief, yeah. What was it like to, to finally be released from that sentence? I mean, were you counting? Oh my God! Were you counting down the days? Oh yeah, counting down the months. Yeah, it was. Yeah, it was unbelievable. Yeah, I mean, because I'm still only a kid when I get out. I'm still only like just sixteen something when I get out. But I wasn't out. I'm not, I wasn't out long, Steve, and I got myself into trouble again, mm. and uh, I ended up back in the same Boston right. about six, seven months later. Yeah. So. And what, and that was that, as well. what was that for, Paddy? I got out, so like I've been in Boston, and, and you know, you get out here with a different attitude. Like I said, I was, I was a bit old, I was 16, maybe I was coming up 17, and we, we were trying to get in pubs again, we were a bit older. And uh, I was outside a nightclub one night, and there was a group of posh lads, well, same posh, you know, a couple of years older than us. And there was a bit of an old, old, something happened, a few words were said, and uh, just to cut it straight, me and my mate robbed him. Uh, I think I took a coat off one, he took a jumper off another. And uh, and that was it, and, you know, it was wrong. But we'd done it. And um, because I'd been to Boston, they picked me out on an ID thing off the uh, off the mug shots. But my friend hadn't been to jail, so they never got him. So I got charged with robbery, street robbery, which today, it's terrible, isn't it? But, uh, and I got a fresh whack of Boston for that. Yeah, I went back to Boston. Same you? routine, back to Durham, back to Strange Ways, back to Boston. What was your sentence? Yeah. It's the same six months or two year, Boston. I think I'd done, uh, I done about another 12, 13 months that time. Was it easy? So by the time I'd come out, I'm 18, 19. Was it easier the second time round, or were you, were you still new? Yeah, it was a lot easier, yeah. Because I'd started to use the gym then. Because what I'd done when I, when I was at school at 15, I'd started boxing. Yeah. It was a boxing Order, uh, St. Peter's, an old man called Harry Round, a uh, big family called the Howard used to use it, and then my friends at school, and, and I, I, I become a half decent boxer, so I started to go to the gym then and do me, do me training, my circuits and that, so yeah, the second time around was a lot easier, and and it's, you do get a little bit more respect, you know, because you've been there before, mm -hmm. many kids, and look, kids look up to things like that, you know, which is wrong, I can see now I'm an adult. It was wrong, but I, I was a, my mentality then was I was a child. You know. 
What was your family's response to you going back to prison? It was it was just as hard for them because it's it's like I, I have kids myself now and I'm, I think to myself, God, if I had to put my parents through that, it's, it would have been heartbreaking. Yeah. So I, I can imagine that they've gone through that, that they'll have been heartbroken. My dad was very quiet. He, he didn't show his feelings. He didn't say a lot. He didn't say a lot. But he did write to me, so that was one good thing. Yeah. When did you um when did you start moving up the, the criminal ladder and, and going from like the petty crimes and, and obviously you moved into that, that street robbery which was a, an advance up the ladder? When did you go to the next level? Uh, I got out of Boston. I was f- falling out of jobs. You could start work on a Monday, finish on a Friday, start another job. There's lots of work about them days. Uh, and I become old enough to drink. So I was using pubs and I was using nightclubs. And it was quite a few years before I got myself back into trouble. And uh, it, was, it was when my, uh, my, my drug dealing started. You know, I used to work on the doors in, in a nightclub. And nightclubs them days used to shut at two o'clock. It wasn't like the are today. Uh, you mainly had work with a bunch of friends. There was a bunch of friends and you'd be the doorman. You wear your own clothes, get paid at the end of the night. But uh, I'd watch other people selling drugs. And in them days, when I say drugs, I mean marijuana. Marijuana, that was about the only drug that was about at the time. And then following that was a bit of amphetamine. There was no other drugs about them days. I'd never heard of cocaine or heroin, never heard of anything like that. Never heard of it. Yeah, so I started selling, uh, I'd, I'd get, get some bits of drugs. A lot of Jamaicans lived in Middlesbrough. So I'd get my drugs off them, probably buy a quarter. Chop it up into five pound deals, ten pound deals, and I sell it on the door to my friends, and that's how it started. Mm-hmm. Yeah, yeah. Were you taking drugs, or was it just a business opportunity that you saw? I've never smoked in my life. Never smoked cigarettes. I've never smoked drugs in my life. Yeah. Uh, over over the years, at, at first, I never took drugs. I have I have had the odd when I've been at a party, and maybe I've had a dabble with, but I didn't like it, so it didn't happen again. Yeah. Uh, Later on in my life, which is in the book, I had a really bad uh, experience with the cocaine. But by this time, I'm, I'm 40 something, 40 years old, so I've gone jumped miles there. Yeah. But I mean, that's the only one time I've ever done it, and it lasted for about six, seven months. And I stopped it as quick as I started it. But going back to when I was a young man on the doors, no, I, did, I didn't use drugs, I just sold them. In a lot of Jamie Boyle's books, people describe Middlesbrough like the Wild West. Was it really that bad? <laughs> You can, I, can, I can go back a long, long way, maybe before Jamie, because I'm a bit older than him. Not much older, like. Uh, you look younger. Like, no, I look younger. <laughs> yeah, I look, yeah. No, you've got, you had Jackie Parsons. These are old school. These are going back to the, the 50s, 60s. You had Jackie Parsons, John Bradley, Dickie Robbo. These were hard men. And then other people come along. Mickey Parsons, uh, John Teasdale. And then you went your way through it. And then you, you got this like young monster who Jamie's wrote several books about who came along. And that's when Jamie's describing the Wild West when the likes of Lee Duffy was running about. This was only a young kid. And he died a young kid. So when he was doing all his, the stuff he was doing, he was really young. But he was uh, he was notorious. And, and he, was, he was like, you can't express how, how, how bad he was. You know, he was very violent. You know, he was a really violent person. He's become, I mean, well, Jamie's written books about him. Obviously, you know, he's been mentioned in other books as well. I've mentioned him in the book with, uh, with Stephen Sears. I mean, the Sears were very yeah. friends with, with Lee Duffy. What, what was he yeah. really like? I mean, you, you know, you're being very honest about him there. Was, you know, yeah. he almost become a, a bit of a legend in, in your parts. I know when yeah. Yeah, he was a legend, yeah. He always will be. Yeah. yeah. I, I, knew, I knew Lee really well. I knew him personally. I, I knew him really personally. I mean, I've sat down with them on my own. We've had, we've had a drink on our own. We sat and had a chat. Uh, he was good friends with my brother-in-law, a man called Dale Ennison Tan, who's married my sister, Teresa. So I didn't have him on my back, never, ever. You know, he never, ever... He'd always give me, like, a wide breath because he was, he was a friend of the family type of thing. Yeah. But if you were, I mean... He, he, if, you, if you were a criminal in Middlesbrough at the time, Lee was running about, no matter what sort of criminal you were, what you were doing, he wanted a piece of it. And you'd have to give him it. You'd have to take it, you know. You know, he was a bully, but in that fraternity, if you know what I mean, you have a fraternity of criminals, and he was a bully in that fraternity. If you were out with your wife having a meal, he, w- he wouldn't bother you. 
if you were just Mr. Smith, you'd probably pay for your meal or something, you know what I mean? But if you're in that criminal fraternity, you live by the sword, you die by the sword. And he was the biggest fish in the, in the pond. Did it, you know? did it surprise you how he met his end? Did it surprise you that he was, you know, that he was killed the way that he was? No, not really, no, no. He, he, he was, you know, he was always going to die young. But it was a shame. It was a shame because he was 26, I think, when he died, 26 years old. Mm -hmm. I mean, I've got, I've got a son now, 26, and he goes to work, and I look at him and I think, God, you know, but Lee, Lee ran the town. He ran the northeast at the end, I think. Yeah. Um, yeah, yeah, yeah. Interesting story, and, uh, of course, Jamie Boyle's written uh, a couple of really good books, yeah. done some documentaries on him. Uh, Brian Cockrell, uh, of course. Oh, Brian. The tax yeah. man, of course, uh, where is, is another well-known name from, from your parts. Have you had any dealings with Brian? Yeah, yeah, I like Brian. He's actually a really, really lovely man. I don't know if you've met him or sat down with him, but he's ah. a gentleman. He's a gentleman. And uh, if anything, I, th I think his little thing with Lee Duffy might, might have uh, put him on the wrong path because I don't think he would have ever been a tax man. He was so into his bodybuilding and things like that. But obviously, he's... Like my wife said, sometimes got on the bus and I got off a few wrong stops. I think that's what happened with Brian. I, I find Brian a big, lovable teddy bear. But you've seen the size of him. If he's snapped, he, he just destroy you. But I've never seen him in that situation. I've never seen him. He has taxed me once in, in a funny way, you know. But, you know, I, I got him back and he, he was going to kill me and give me a cuddle in the end. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> Tell us about the drugs and what, ha what happened from, you know, getting involved, selling them on the doors to a few mates. Did things escalate for you, Paddy? Yeah, they escalate, yeah. Middlesbrough had, had a massive uh, Jamaican influx. They used to come from, they used to have a Michael called the Speakies. That's where I worked. I worked there with Dave Bishop and his brother Colin and a few more doormen, Tony Boyd. And maybe two or three nights a week, we get minibuses coming down from Leeds, Bradford. So there was a lot of Jamaicans using our nightclub. I did all Jamaican music, all the reggae. And it was good. It was a good nightclub. So, like, I started making more friends. I started getting more drugs. There was more, there was more demand for it. There was more demand for it. And so you needed more supply. So I met the demand. And, and I upped my supply. And I started buying more. I started selling more. Before you know it, you know, I, I was selling nine bars. Half kilos, kilos, and I was just passing it on. So it, it you don't realise that you're escalating up the ladder, yeah. Because you know, you're doing it with friends and people like you know. I wasn't, I wasn't driving down to Manchester or meeting people in petrol stations. I w there was no phone calls. It was all because there no, was no phones in days. It was like John would want something, I'd get him it. Yeah. Peter wants something, I'd get it. I, I could get it, and I wanted it, and that, that's the way it's, it's, it's starting to escalate. Rising up the ladder, of course, brings not only attention from the police, but also attention from potential rivals. Were there yeah. ever any attempts on your life, Brian, because of this? Uh, Paddy, because of this? Yeah, yeah. A lot later on there was, yeah. Yeah. Not at first. My drug dealing at first was just street level. Moving up, moving up the ladder a little bit. Uh, it, was, it was when I... Uh, I, I want to miss a load out now. So I've gone from working on the doors, selling locally in Middlesbrough South Bank, in the in the Teesside area, and then uh, I moved on. I got married. Me and Debbie got married. Uh, I'd, I'd done a couple of jail sentences in the meantime, and me and Debbie got married. Uh, I mean, I done one jail sentence. I got filled in, uh, and I got three and a half years. You know, and, I, and Debbie was pregnant with my second son then. I would care us. We all had our, had our race. I had a fight on Union Street with two Jamaican lads, uh, Darren Murray and and his, his brother Jason. Me and Adam had a fight, he nearly killed me. He nearly killed me. He had a policeman with an axe and he was really charged with attempted murder, but the policeman turned out okay. He got four years and I got three and a half. So then when I went to jail, I got married. And everyone surmises that you've got money, everyone thinks you've got money. And I've come to jail and I hadn't really, Steve, I was on my ass. But like, you've got a persona to, to, to show. So I went to see a local drug dealer. It was like, we up the ladder above me. John McCormick, and uh, I, I told him the truth. I said, Mommy, I asked, blah, blah, blah. I could do the nine bar on tick. I was just going to start all over again. Anyway, he gave me a kilo on tick and just said, Whenever. And I started working with John. He started giving me bits, and I was soon back up the ladder. 
Then uh, John moved to Spain. He lived in Spain. He took, more or less took Spain across the Delta Lover in uh, Fungarola. And I went over, I met him, and that's when I really like stepped up the ladder. Like I really stepped up and he was like, he was massive, John. He was support, he was supplying, like you're talking, maybe 600 kilo to Great Britain. And I'd get maybe 200 or 300 of them off him. And it was, you know, like you say, how, how do you feel about it? I knew for a the fact then that my life wasn't my life. You know, it wasn't my life no more. I, when I was doing it for myself and buying nine bars kilos off John in England, you, you do what you want. But now I'm in a situation now where I'm, I've, I've met people, I've been introduced to people, and you know their business, you know their business works. And it's, it's, uh, it's very daunting, actually. You know, you don't realise. And then when I did realise, it was probably too late. You know, uh, I'd been working with John for a long, long time, and we were doing great. We were good friends. He looked after me, and I was making good money. And then all of a sudden... He, uh, he met somebody else, he had another partner, an Irish fella. I didn't get on with him. I didn't like him, I didn't trust him. And he, and he something happened, so, some, something went missing, and uh, he blamed me. And he, he sent him to come over to kill me, come over to kill me. You know what I mean? So, but it was a bit daunting. Yeah. Like, I, I got through it because I hadn't done anything wrong. So when you haven't done anything wrong, you can argue. What had happened? There was a friend of mine called Paul Bryan. He's doing a couple of life sentences now. Uh, the, the lad's a lunatic. And uh, I was in Spain. And uh, I've told this story before. I'm sat at the table with John and John saying to me, how much have you got left out of 300? I said, I've got 30k. I can't sell it. Irish Bryan comes over and says to me, can you get rid of it? I can't. Can't get rid of it. It's there. Add it on the next lot. I'm not running about Middlesbrough. Try and sell it. To any Tom DiParati. So a little bit of an argument, and Paul Bryan sat on a couple of tables away and he went, Paddy, I can sell that as soon as I get home for you. So like, I looked at John and John and give him it. But I'm annoyed for this man. You know, so I goes up to England and I give his Paulie. I don't know what happened with it. Paul lost it. Got nothing to do with me. But Irish Brian decided it is, it's my fault. So he's pestered me, he's pestered my family, he's threatening my kids. He's sending people to the schools, to my father-in-law's place of work. The full family is like terrified. And then he come over. Uh, a lad knocked the lad brought to my house, knocked on the door, and he went, the outside pad. And he ran on my front with guns. And my wife shit herself, she was screaming, the kids were crying, and he drove off. So my family had to go away. And it took about four or five weeks to, to get this this sorted, you know. And I did get it sorted because I hadn't done anything wrong, but I used to realise then I was just, you know, I, it was, I, was, I wasn't big enough. I, I was out my league. I was out my league. And, and it went away. It went away. But then it raises, raises it again. A few, a few months later, John, John McCormick had moved to Denmark and he was phoning me. And like I said, it had gone away, but then he went to me, Pad, can you sort that money out? I went, I ain't got no money, mate, you're not getting that off me. And cut long story short, he come over to England. Me and John were good friends. And we became good friends again because I, we buried the hatchet over the carry-on had gone on. It wasn't my fault, it was Paul's. And then John got killed in Denmark. He got shot in Denmark and killed. And I look at these people like Paul's doing life now. Uh, John's dead. My other friend, John McParland, died in jail. And like these are all dead, and I'm still here. So yeah, I'm lucky. Yeah, yeah very, very lucky. I mean, it's a, it's a hell of a story, as I say. If anybody wants to read about it, it's uh, the Altar Boy, uh, yeah. by yourself, by Jamie Boyle from Warcry Publishing. What made you go straight and get out of that world? And was it, was it the fact that you saw people around you die and go to prison, or was it just one morning you woke up and thought, well, actually, I'm out of my depth here, and um, you know. I need to, I need to screw me low for, and otherwise I'm going to be following suit. Yeah, I was on my depth, and I realised I was on my depth. So that was one of the main reasons. That was the main reason I was on my depth. But we settled down. We got a little pub in Global called the Penny. Me and Debbie we run it for years. Then we went to Spain for a while. Then we come back. We got a social club called the Middlebeck, and we, we're happy as Larry. We have our ups and downs, but we're happy. And we're going to end one power station, as well as the club. And we're making a living. We're making a living. 
the club's expensive. Then I get a phone call off Paul Bryan, my friend who's doing a couple of life sentences, and um, just to the stupid like along the lines of never guess who I album didn't know yesterday. You know, Mick Morgan. Mick Morgan's a scout that I knew from like 35 years ago. And now I, I remember I was a cheeky little scouter with an XR club. I didn't realise how big he was. So he, he gave Mick Morgan my phone number. And uh, Mick phoned me a couple of times. And you know what's coming. Paddy, can you get rid of any uh, amphetamine for me? No, I don't do it no more. And I've sat in a club one afternoon. I know one of the kids that do it. I ask him, are you, are you okay? He went, no, that's crap. I said, I can get you some. And it just started again. Started. But all I was doing then, I'd get it off his partner, Chris Welch. He's known as the uh, Pavel Escobar of Liverpool. He's, he's do, he was already doing 16 years, so he was holding me from jail. He was doing 16 years. And he was setting me down. I'd get every 100 quid off him, 100 quid off the kid I give it to. I was getting 200 pounds a kilo. I've just been like a middleman. I'd get it off him and give it to somebody else. And uh, there was a massive, uh, he was doing 16 years. He'd only done about 12 months of it, every 14 months. And he started doing it again, working in jail. And I was working with him. They all got arrested, and I'd, I'd, I'd packed in about seven months, and then they all got arrested. Uh, they're all on remand on bail and everything from Liverpool, Scotland, Wales, and um, Manchester. And uh, but what happened was my phone number and my name kept popping up in books and dead lists and things like that. So the company middles were seven months later and just arrested me. And uh, I, I mean, I had really stopped. I'd, I'd had enough, and I wasn't doing it no more. But the conspiracy that dragged me in, you know, it got me five and a half K, you know, and it was like, I can't get five and a half K, I haven't done anything, yeah. you know, but like the judge looked at it, that he, he didn't, my barrister, Caroline, or her name now, Caroline Goodwin, she went, it's not about the drugs that you've had, it's about the conspiracy that you're involved in, it was absolutely massive, so he got another 12 years, so he's done 28 years, and that was one of the lowest sentences, I got five and a half year. and like, that was like, I mean, I'm a granddad. Don't get me wrong. Hey, I don't have no sympathy. It was my own fault. I knew exactly what I was doing. Yeah. But like at that age, I was 58 years old. And, you know, we were struggling in the club. But that wasn't the reason. And like my wife didn't know I was doing it. Like, I may get 400 quid. It was just bought the shopping. I wasn't going out buying flash cars or Rolex watches, you know. But I got caught. I got five and a half years. I done my jail in Liverpool and in Preston. And uh, I never come down here to do my jail. And you know, I, I got out of Kirklev. And like, God, never again. It's done. Yeah. You no, know, I should never have done a kid a favour in jail. But, you know, like you can talk about things you th and people will probably sit here and go like, he's full of shit. His wife must have known. I never took my, my work home to my wife. My wife said, my wife works since she left school at 15 year old. She's been an hairdresser. She still does it now. You know, she worked hard. Yes, yeah, she knew I was a drug dealer. Yes, yeah, she tried to change me many times. But I was who I am. And uh, thank God she stuck by me. Thank God, yeah. We hear a lot about blues parties in, in a lot of Jamie's books. And, uh, you know, Newcastle, yeah. Newcastle's never really experienced that kind of thing. I know. They were brilliant. Tell us, tell us a little bit about what a blues party was like. Most party was like, like I said, I used to went to Speakeasy nightclub and it was full of Jamaicans who used to come down. We had two old Jamaicans in Middlesbrough, a man called Ramsey and a man called Brownman. These were really old men, nice men, and they'd have a big house in the town centre somewhere and they keep swapping and change it to keep the police weren't bothered, to keep the police on the toes. And when I used to go, it'd be full of white women, obviously, you know, they like the Jamaican lads, mainly full of Jamaicans. And when I used to go, there was only two white lads got in there, that was me. Because I worked in the speakeasy, my lad called John Boyden, who worked in the speakeasy. He never got white lads in there. And then uh, then we went like for years, it was brilliant. You'd go there at four or five in the morning. That's where I could sell most of my drugs. It was brilliant. I loved the music. Uh, I had some really good friends that were I were coloured. I still they're still friends now. And uh, but then it all started to change when you started getting the white lads coming in. And uh, I can't just blame Lee Duffy because there was lots of news to come. But the likes of Lee coming to the blows would spoil it because the Jamaicans were petrified of him. So, and then it'd be, it'd be coming, and then you'd have taxis pulling up, lads fighting on the front, people kicking the doors, 
people running in with them, and I was like, ah, oh. but before you could just go and just sit there, chill out, have a game of cards, have some food. But when the likes of Lee started using it, and I think he used to bring his friends down from Newcastle, I think they used to come down. So they're one of witnessed the blows like it was, you know, it was just a late night club now, mainly full of white lads. We come from all different parts of Middlesbrough town and meet there and just fight. It wasn't the blows no more. Steve, Steve as Michael says, I've often spoken about, about going down there with Lee and having some yeah. good nights out. Like, I think they went for the experience as opposed to the fighting, like, but I suppose... Yeah, 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 yeah. 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 Well, I mean, they still have the blows and I was in Leeds, I would imagine, yeah. I've been to the blows in Leeds, completely different. They're like night clubs. But Middlesbrough was just a small place. Yeah. yeah. But I've had some good times, some bad times, and I'd like to think I've paid my dues, but, you know. What's your biggest regret, Paddy? My biggest regret, like I said at the beginning of the, of the interview, I wish, I wish I'd got a trade. And I can't blame not having a trade for being a drug dealer. I think once I started drug dealing, it's such a small level, like you're talking, five pound deals, ten pound deals. Remember, no cocaine, no heroin was about. So, and you're giving it to your friends. I didn't feel like a drug dealer then, but obviously as I'm moving up the ladder, I start to realise what I am. And it brings a lot of jealousy with it. A lot of people in the town don't like me. Uh, a lot of people will call me behind my back. Maybe just want to talk to my face. But my biggest regret is, is not just having a normal life. It must be just unbelievable just to have a normal life. Because mm. I've never had one. Yeah. What's it been like, you know, writing the book? Has that been a bit therapeutic for you? And um, yeah. what, do you hope, what do you hope that what do you hope that any maybe aspiring criminal gets from that when he reads it? You know, I started this book about 10, 12 years ago. I used to write it at home. And then when I went to jail, I, I tried it again. And then when I come home, Jamie phoned me about Lee Duffy, because I knew him really well. And I said, I've been trying to write a book. And he went, right. And that's where it come from. And writing that book, you know, I mean, my, my wife, I'd write it, and she put it on the computer. And we'd fight every night. Because I'm terrible with dates and places. And I'd be telling something, she'd be going, it didn't happen like that. It didn't happen then. We'd get into fighting. But uh, it, yeah, it brought it home to me, because there's some really truthful parts in it that are hateful to myself and my family. And, and I mentioned them. Yeah, but uh, anyone reading it, I mean, look, these kids are there, they have no fear. So my, I know Brian's trying to help all these young kids with knives and that. I don't think kids listen to you these days. They're not scared of teachers, not scared of the police, they're not scared of you or me. So if any kid picks that book and reads it, being a drug dealer, it's shite. It's absolutely terrible life. It was then, but these kids won't listen, I don't think, because I think they know better. But please, honestly, just get a job. Just, I mean, the police take everything off, you know. It's, it's the, you know, proceeds of crime. They leave you with nothing, and then you've got to come back out and start again and do it again. I just wish I, I had got a job, then a trade, electrician, whatever, it doesn't matter. And provide for my family properly. That's my biggest regret, not, not providing for them properly. Yeah. I think the key word, the key words, it's not glamorous. You know what I mean? It, people think no. right, glamorous place, but it, yeah. it's, a mur it's a murky, horrible place. And if you get, if you get in, yeah. then you've yeah. got to be You've been trouble with your family, Steve. I mean, I see kids now and I'll drive and you still hear conversations. I still have friends who are drug dealers and they will be my friends for the rest of my life. But it doesn't mean I'm a drug dealer. But you see these young kids now driving about and being flash cars and that. And then I bump into one of the dads and they bump me, oh, I was so and so's cause mad. I've had them at the door and they've smashed me windows. They've done this. It's your family that suffer. You yeah. might be living the high life with your Rolex watches and your fast cars and your women. But your family suffer. Neither your parents, your brothers, your sisters, your wife, your kids. People suffer. Mm -hmm. Close people to you. Yeah. You know, as well as other people. And with the drugs now, the drugs now are terrible. This cocaine, I don't crack cocaine. It's just these strange families. Destroying families. Do you think? Um, I mean, there's there's a lot of calls for legalization of drugs. Do you think the legalization of like maybe a, a drug like cannabis for starters would be more beneficial? I mean, it has it has a lot of healing properties. Cannabis there's a lot of people benefit yeah. medically. And well, yeah, you, you go to Amsterdam, you have cafes there. It's it's controlled, isn't it? Yeah. And it, it does stop the drug dealers, doesn't it? It stops them. You got. I mean, in Spain, you, you, I think you're allowed to have so much on your on your person, you know. Yeah, I think it should leak. I don't. I don't know about the, the hard drugs. I mean, I, I don't know about heroin and cocaine. I don't know about. No, I, about I, 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 but I think certainly, certainly something like cannabis. There's a lot of call for it. 
politi yeah. politicians, etc. There's a lot of politicians yeah. calling for the legalization of cannabis, but yeah. it's certainly free of finances as well to, to probably target, yeah. you know, target. And also help yeah. people to become addicted. You know what I mean? People, people well, I, I, I think you like your cannabis now, you know, I think it's the synthetic drugs now. Yeah. It's getting important from China. Yeah, that's what's killing people, the synthetic yeah. drugs. Yeah. So I don't know what they're taking. Yeah. Yeah. Well, it's great to speak to you, and obviously, good luck with the book. And as I've said, people can get uh, the Altar Boy from Warcry Publishing um, and, and from all good bookshops down in, in Middlesbrough as well. Yeah. Yeah. You know, I've read the book myself, Steve, you know, and I swear, honestly. I tried twice. Have you? That's my book. Yeah, honestly. When I read it myself, when it was all put together, I sat down on my own and read it. Yeah, I tried, yeah. yeah. It's a sad book. It's a funny book, truthful book, and it's sad. Yeah. Great stuff. Well, it's been an absolute pleasure catching up with you. Hopefully this helps sell a few more books. But for now, Paddy, thanks very much. Thank you, Steve.